that's a good place to start. Everything runs out. I think that's the heart of the climate change debate, that we're using more than the Earth can replenish. For most of us, the climate change debate seems something very far and distant from our lives. We're too busy enjoying the pleasures of it to really care what's going to be the costs, and if the costs are going to be, uh, you know, some people tell us 2020 is doomsday, we really believe it's going to take two, 300 years before it catches up with us, and it seems too far for us to care. As I said earlier, Bjorn Lomborg is a green prophet, but he's somebody who's trying to wean us away from the fervor of that religion. And so, Bjorn, to begin with, what are the facts and myths of the climate change debate, according to you? Well, so much great to be here. I mean, first of all, I think it's important to get the, the sense of what is the climate debate really about. There's a lot of people who say it's the end of the world, and there's equally a lot of people who say, oh, it's all made up stuff. And it's neither. I think it's important to be able to voice that middle point where you say, yes, global warming is real. We're putting up more and more CO2 in the atmosphere, mainly by burning fossil fuel, and that will eventually increase temperatures, and significantly so, so that it'll actually have a negative impact on the planet. We also need to scale back the fear factor. If any of you have seen, for instance, Al Gore's movie, it was a great example of scaring the pants off of people. Now, I understand why you want to do that, because you want to get people's attention, and so you scare them but it doesn't work in the long run because global warming is a 100 or at least a 50 year problem and you can't scare people for 100 years. And so what's inevitably happening is that people get bored with the whole topic and now we've kind of stopped talking about it. We're much more concerned about uh, uh, an immediate uh, 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 breakdown in the economic system. So yes, global warming is real. Much of what is claimed about it that it's gonna have these dramatic neg negative impacts are exaggerated, but it doesn't mean it's not a problem we need to fix. But we need to fix it smarter. So Bjorn, uh, part of your argument is that one, the, the scale of the fear is wrong. You know, that we are in panic room when we don't need to be in panic room. Uh, but you're also saying that we are spending money in the wrong places, cool. you know? Today, a lot of governments are committed to uh, cutting carbon emissions. Um, you're arguing that that's the wrong thing to do. Isn't that, uh, you know, you said that Al Gore did, uh, his film was meant to create fear, and we must hand it to him that at least he got people into the debate. Absolutely. Uh, so two questions. One, why are you saying we're spending money wrong? And two, are we, uh, you know, by lowering the temperature of the debate, are you really pushing it back uh, right. too, too many years? Listen, first of all, hats off to Al Gore for making us realize it's a problem, especially a lot of right-wing Americans uh, to realize this is actually a problem. So great. But the problem is that the immediate argument, you know, if CO2 is a problem, then we should cut CO2. That seems such an obvious idea. The problem is, of course, we don't actually burn fossil fuel to annoy Al Gore. We burn it because it fundamentally powers everything we like about civilization. And that's why we use more and more of it. And as long as green energy is much more expensive than fossil fuels, we will never get a revolution going. Remember, the biggest users of, of, uh, in the world per capita of solar panels is, is, is Germany. I mean, if, if you've ever been to Germany, you know that's slightly weird. Uh, but, but the fundamental problem, of course, is they have spent the equivalent of about $75 billion subsidizing solar panels. The net effect will be to postpone global warming by the end of the century by seven hours. Well, congratulations. This is not about you know, putting up a solar panel and feeling good about yourself. It's about making sure that we all eventually will switch away from fossil fuels and use solar panels. But we won't as long as they're four to six times as expensive as fossil fuels. So instead of focusing on making subsidies to inefficient technologies, we should be focusing on spending lots more money on research and development into green energy. Because imagine, if we could make solar panels cheaper than fossil fuels, we'd be done. Everything would be fine. Everyone would switch, not because we had to force them, but simply because it would be cheaper. And that's the real trick. To spend money instead of subsidies that work incredibly inefficiently, spend it on research and development. Right now, the world spends on the order of $250 billion. That's just what the EU has decided to spend on cutting carbon emissions in the EU. That's the only one that's legal for, for right now. Remember, if the EU actually does this, all the models show that by the end of the century, we will have lowered temperatures by 0.05 degrees, a 20th of one degree centigrade. We won't be able to measure the difference at a cost of about $20 trillion. The, the simple question is, is there a better way to spend that money? And yes, there is. Spend less money 
but spend it on research and development into green energy. And then in 20 to 40 years, everyone will have green energy that's cheaper than fossil fuels and will have solved the problem. Well, it, it, it does seem inarguable that, uh, you know, if mankind is to switch its comforts from one power source to the other, it better make pragmatic sense because not all of us are going to do it in an idealistic uh, motive, you know. Yeah. But beyond, uh, even as journalists, you know, we often write against the power sector, energy plants, you know, we write against coal plants, we write against thermal uh, plants, we write against wow. dams. And I often tell our journalists that we have to write about this in complex ways because we are anti everything. We are anti nuclear power, we are anti wind energy, it takes up too much land, you know. So, uh, by your reckoning, I, I forgot to mention that apart from all those accomplishments I read out, Bjorn is also the director of the Copenhagen Consensus Center, which is doing a lot of research work in all this. So, Bjorn, of all these alternate forms of energy, which do you think is the one that people should be spending money on? <laughs> If we knew, we'd already have the solution. I don't think we know who, which technology is going to win. I think with the, the presentation we saw uh, uh, early uh, this morning, where Justin was showing us a lot of technologies that might work, that's the kind of thing that we need. We need you know, a thousand Justins. We need all these different avenues explored. And the amazing thing, of course, is to recognize that individual researchers are very, very cheap. And I don't mean that in a bad way, Justin, but you know, fundamentally, the idea is that we can afford to spend money on a lot of researchers looking at a lot of different avenues. I don't know which one is gonna win, but we don't need a lot of them to win. We just need one, and that's the power source that's gonna power the rest of the 21st century. So the real trick here is to recognize it's all about investing in future technology. If you'll allow me a, a, a metaphor in, in a sense, if you think about the 1950s and you think about computers, how would we have gotten computers to be more effective and essentially get computers to everyone? The, the current sense of, of, of thinking would be to say, we've got to massively subsidize them. We've got to give everyone in India a computer in 1960. That would have been a s terrible idea. It would have cost a lot of money, and it would basically have meant we've gotten really, really fast vacuum tubes. Uh, other people would have said, well, we've got to tax alternative technology. We've got to tax typewriters or, or make quotas for slide rulers. That would have been a silly idea, too. You don't get computers going. What we should have done, and fortunately what we did, was to invest dramatically in research and development, get the transistor, get the integrated circuit, get all the other stuff together. And then, of course, in 1982, computers technology was so cheap that IBM and Apple could make computers that we actually wanted to buy. And today, you don't have this discussion of, oh, God, who's going to buy 100 billion, uh, million computers? We buy them because they're cheap. And that's the trick. That's where we need to get to. And as you mentioned, I run something called the Copenhagen Consensus, where we bring together some of the world's top economists to look at what are the smart ways to spend money. And basically, what they tell us is if you want to fix global warming, they looked at this run in the run-up to the Copenhagen conference in, in 2009. I don't know if you remember. It was supposed to be the big conference to solve all problems. Of course, it broke down entirely. Uh, but the real issue here was to say, instead of spending money as the EU is doing, spending $250 billion on doing virtually no good, they said, spend money on research and development. You could spend about $100 billion on making sure that we get technologies that'll work in 20 to 40 years. Then also spend money on adaptation. I mean, remember, if you're actually about to be flooded, it doesn't help to cut carbon emissions because you're still gonna be flooded. If you want to help people in the short run, you need to focus on adaptation. So spend about $50 billion on adaptation around the world. We could make most of the world cooler, for instance, by making cities cooler where most people live. Cities are incredibly warm because there are lots of asphalt, a lot of, of, of very few trees, very few water features. Place more of those in there, make more cities white, make the rooftops white, make the asphalt uh, in, a, in a lighter color, and we can make cities much cooler than global warming is gonna make them hotter. And it's very cheap, it's very easy, easily done. They're very simple and sensible things. And then what I'd like to talk a little bit about also is that would still leave $100 billion of what just the EU is spending. And that $100 billion could save all the other major problems in the world. The UN estimate that for about $100 billion, we could give clean drinking water, sanitation, basic health care, education, and food to everyone who needs it on the planet. And my concern is a little bit, you know, I come from a rich country, we, we worry a lot about global warming. But if you go outside the compound here in, 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 in the Hyatt, 
you realize there are lots of other problems. And if your kids aren't getting a proper education, if they're dying from easily curable infectious diseases, if you don't have access to clean drinking water, there are other and more immediate issues than global warming. So is your, uh, you know, before we come to the argument of how we should be spending the money, you mentioned which, you know, that we should be funding research rather yeah. than funding uh, uh, premature Absolutely. appliances, you know. Uh, so what is your own thinking beyond? Should this research funding come from government? Should it be a private enterprise? I think that's a big debate about, you know, where is research really going to happen? Because uh, who's really going to uh, sort of invest in this long-term uh, yeah. uh, turnaround? Yeah this will have to be fundamentally government money, a little bit like we do with, uh, with blue sky research in the medical sector. You don't expect medical companies to come up with blue sky stuff that's gonna give you Nobels, that's gonna give you vi vital long-term insights, but not actually produce a medicine right away. And that's why we need to recognize this is gonna be through government think tanks and, and, and government universities. What, of course, we do spend money on is to make sure that we finally get the, uh, those med uh, medications out through medical companies. And likewise, we need to work together with the private sector to get these technologies into the real world. But you need to spend the money first on getting solar panels to uh, you know, maybe 50% too expensive. And then we can mass produce it. And then, of course, it'll become much cheaper. So it is about spending the money in the public sector. But we should also do so smartly. Of course, there are lots of ways to do it badly. Uh, but, and, and I think we should take a, a page from the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation playbook. They actually asked, what are the most important things that we'd like to see solved? They came up with 54 answers from Blue Ribbon Panel. Uh, and, and wouldn't that be great to ask you know, a blue ribbon panel, what are the 100 things that we would like to see solved over the next decade? And I don't know what those, I, I'm not at all in that technical uh, sphere. You know, my, my sense is I'd love to see like self-assembling solar panels maybe. Uh, you know, so they would be much, much cheaper to put up. You just simply put them next to each other and they'll assemble themselves. Or maybe you know, solar panels are also waterproof and can wrap around uh, uh, cylinders. Or there are lots of different ways. Make those 100 goals and then set X prizes, a little bit like the guys who said, you know, who can get into space first, and make researchers go for that. Because that would incentivize a lot of public uh, 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 researchers to say, I want to be the guy who fixes uh, X Prize 87. You know, it's not going to be a lot of money. It's just $10 million. It would be a very small part of the pool of $100 billion we we're going to spend on research and development. It would be much cheaper than what we're doing right now, and it would have a lot bigger influence in the long run. So where do you stand on this extremely fractured debate about whether it's the first world com uh, countries you know, who really heated the planet beyond bearing, or the third world countries who are getting onto that arc that who should really be cutting their emissions? Where do you stand on that political debate? Does it really mean that right now nobody should bother until the correct technology comes into place? Well, I think, I think it's, it's very clear. And one of the reasons why all these debates have broken down is because that's an unsolvable question. You know, the rich world is going to say, well, we're doing something, but we can't afford to do it all. And you are very rightly going to say, listen, we haven't polluted the atmosphere. We're not going to do this. We're poor. We want to get ahead. And the real and honest answer is you're never going to get either the rich world or the developing world to cut their carbon emissions as long as that's going to be costly. That's the real truth. And that's the one that Al Gore and many others seem to be intent on ignoring. And that's why, remember, we've spent almost 20 years since the first Rio summit. We've basically, in 1992, we have been promising to cut carbon emissions, and we've done no such thing. The Kyoto Protocol, even if we actually had done it, we wouldn't have been able to measure the impact in 100 years. Of course, we did no such thing at all. We probably uh, uh, cut about half a percentage point of, of emissions of 1990 is 100. It would have been 142.7% now. Uh, instead, it's 142.2. Congratulations, world. We, we've spent 20 years and gotten nowhere. We can choose to take another decade and talk fantasy and say, let's promise this, let's promise that, or start going down the road where we say we're going to intensify research and development, we're going to get much better technology, and that is actually going to make it advantageous, both for rich worlds and developing worlds, to switch. So in the meantime, Bjorn, you were saying that there are many ways we can spend money better, you know, so which are the priorities you would, uh, or which you've been backing at the Copenhagen Center? Well, we asked some of the world's top economists, where do you get the biggest bang for climate? And that was what I mentioned, we should invest in research and development rather than cutting carbon emissions. But we also asked them, 
Where should you spend money in the world in general? Because remember, there are lots and lots of problems. There's you know, two and a half billion people don't have access to clean drinking water and sanitation. There's about 15 million people that die from infectious diseases. One fourth of the world, that, uh, one fourth of the deaths in the world are from easily curable infectious diseases. There's a billion people uh, who don't have access to, uh, uh, to food or at least enough food. There are lots and lots of problems. Not all solutions are equally cheap. And so we asked the very, very cynical question, where do you get the most bang for your buck if you want to do good in the world? And what they told us was, and you're probably going to not know of this even, which is one of the reasons why I think we need the Copenhagen consensus. What they found was we should invest in micronutrient malnutrition. That's the very best investment. You probably go, what? what what's that? Um, we all know about m malnutrition. Uh, about a billion people don't have enough food. The problem with fixing that is it's actually kind of expensive because providing a meal or two meals a day, a lot of calories, is actually hard both uh, logistically and it's also costly. But there's about three billion people who don't get the right composition, especially in micronutrients. Essentially, they don't get a vitamin pill. Two and a half billion people lack just one uh, 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 constituent uh, iron. And that's very, very simple to add, just like we add iodine to salt. We could add it to some uh, basic uh, uh, staple foods. It would be very, very cheap, and it has huge impacts. We estimate the average impact for these two and a half billion people is that they, are, uh, they get about 17% less strong, and they lose somewhere between four and eight IQ points. So we have a situation where half the world's population, almost half the world's population, is weaker and dumber than they have to be, and the solution would cost about $200 million. Not billion dollars, $200 million. And I think the beauty of this, of course, then we go on and we also show we should focus on free trade, we should focus on schooling of girls, we should focus on, on, on uh, 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 sorry, uh, anti health means. Oh my god, I can't remember. Uh, get, getting rid of worms in kids uh, because it's an incredibly uh, uh, cheap way both to get uh, uh, kids to be healthier and also learn more in school. And of course, then they'll get end up being much better uh, as, as citizens and actually make a lot more money and help their countries to get, uh, get out of their, their rut. There are a lot of very, very cheap ways to fix some of the other problems in the world. So yes, let's fix climate change smartly and let's leave up money to actually remember that there are many other problems where we can also do a lot of good. I totally agree with you, Beyond, but I don't think the, the absence of, I agree that we are, you know, listening to you, one feels that we are spending good money down a drain that's uh, not going to lead anywhere. But I don't think it's the absence of funds that really stops the world from spending on malaria, malnutrition, uh, you know, iron nutri micronutrients. I think the big thing is about making good causes sexy, you know. I mean, how do you catch people's fancy? How do you catch the people who have money? How do you get big, glorious charities to charity events uh, organized around them? And that, again, brings us back to, uh, you know, what have been, has there been criticism of you in stopping the climate change debate from escalating? Because at least it had become sexy and it had become something that everyone was scared about. I, nobody's scared about malaria because it's not really affecting the rich, you know? Yeah. So how do we make TB? I mean, AIDS got funds because suddenly everybody felt everyone was going to die of AIDS, you yeah. know? So how do, how do we make all these issues you just spelled out sexy enough for money to come to them? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's very telling that this question comes from a journalist, right? Because it, in some ways, we'd love to make it sexy, but I think, unfortunately, that's exactly the problem. We are now spending a lot of money on things that look sexy. But what we have to ask ourselves is, do we want to be remembered by our kids and grandkids for having focused on sexy things, or do we want to actually have solved things? And, and so I think it's, it's about scaling back the conversation and say, let's talk about what actually works rather than what's sexy. Uh, and so you could say we're defenders of unsexy problems, of the boring problems, but the important problems. Uh, and we're uh, defenders of boring solutions to the, remember, the, the, the most uh, 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 the most participated climate change event in the world is, I, I don't know if you know this, this is the World Wildlife Fund. They, they sponsor the uh, switch off your light for an hour every, every year. Uh, about two billion people participate. It's a beautiful event, you know, they turn off the lights from, uh, for the Sydney Opera House and the Eiffel Tower, the Empire State Building, it makes for great news and it makes everybody feel really, really cool, they're really helping along. Of course, it's turn off your lights, not your computer or your TV or your dishwasher or your heater or your cooler, all the other things that would actually be inconvenient. Uh, and, and of course, what you also do, at least if you're like my friends, you, turn, you, know, you light up a couple of candles and actually end up emitting more CO2. 
to in the, in, in the process. But the real point, of course, is it teaches you, oh, fixing climate change is easy. It's about switching off the light one hour every Saturday, w once every Saturday, uh, a, a year uh, on, on a Saturday. No, it's going to be a lot harder than that. And so what we have to tell people is it's not the easy, it's not the sexy solution, but it's the ones that will actually work. So you know, I, I think the right answer is to, to, to ask people, and, and I think in some ways Al Gore did that very, very clearly. He said, how do we want to be remembered as a generation? Uh, his, his argument was, of course, he wants us to be remembered for having done the Kyoto Protocol and more like that. And I'm also I'm always very surprised that he and many, many other really well-meaning people want to be remembered for spending hundreds of billions of dollars per year for the rest of the century essentially doing nothing. Uh, I, I doubt our kids and grandkids are going to say, great going there, granddad. But the real point here is to, remember, to be remembered for spending money smartly on fixing climate change and then spending money on all the other perhaps somewhat boring problems, but the ones that will actually make a huge impact on real people's lives and make this planet a much better place to live. Before my last question and the last bell comes, I don't want to be remembered for calling HIV, malnutrition, TB, micronutrients <laughs> boring. <laughs> I was just saying, how do we get people to spend money on that? No, and, and you're right. It is a question of saying, how do we get people to realize there are smarter ways to do this? And I think having a conversation in this place and many others and start asking the very serious question, where do you get the most bang for the buck? I mean, this is, this is how we deal with our own private lives. You know, we have to make decisions. Are we going to spend it on a new car? Are we going to go on a, a trip? Or are we just going to replace our refrigerator? We can't do it all. We do realize we have to prioritize. If we start having that conversation in public, both on climate change, but I would also like to see us having that conversation on the grand challenges of, of, of the world. And one of the beautiful things for, of, of the Copenhagen consensus, and I'd love to leave you guys with, with this idea as well, is the Copenhagen consensus process is really one that you can use in all different kinds of areas. We've just used it on, on HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa, essentially asking where do you get the biggest bang for buck on, on tackling HIV in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. But we've also done it for Danish healthcare. You know, we, we know that we're going to run out of money in healthcare system. What should you do? Where should you spend extra money? And and wouldn't it be fun or exciting or possibly even a great way to help the future generations to have that same conversation about India? Imagine asking how we're going to make India the frontier of civilizations in the next 10 or 20 years. What will it take? Get the analysis of where can you spend money. You clearly can't do everything. Should we be focusing on infrastructure, on education, on health care, on social benefits? What kinds of things should we be doing? and have a national conversation. And Telco be, could be a, a great place to start that. But the real issue here is to say, let's start thinking about where we spend money. Because if we spend it badly one place, it's money we can't spend elsewhere. Thank you, Bjorn. That's a perfect place to end this conversation that if Copenhagen uh, Consensus Center was focusing on India, what would be the priorities they would advise? And then we don't really need them to do that. We should start a national conversation about it. That if we have a limited budget, what should, we, what should we be spending it on? Thank you, Bjorn, for doing that. Thank you very much.